Thanks so much, Brad. I'm going to talk tonight about moral philosophy as it emerged from the Scottish Enlightenment at the end of the 1700s. So towering over the Enlightenment, David Hume and Adam Smith were on a quest to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects, to borrow the subtitle of Hume's treatise. Things didn't go according to plan, though, and therein lies a story. So to be clear, while I'm going to talk about a feature of the academy that I regret, I have no personal complaint. Things have gone well. I've had fabulous mentors, one of whom was Leonard Liggio. Leonard had an extraordinary career and was blessed with some great colleagues. He was an awesome scholar. He did it the right way. He sweated the details. And he put together incredible narrative stuffed with detail. If you've ever heard Leonard lecture, you know what I'm talking about. Leonard also had a moral compass and a big heart, but he was shy. I had many conversations with him when I was a student, but he was so low key. I'd ask him a question. He'd answer in detail with footnotes. And that was the end of the conversation. That's all I got from him in terms of reaction or recognition. So I wasn't sure that he even knew who I was. But then I got my first overseas invitation, and that's how I met Jacques and Pierre Garello in Aix-en-Provence in 1988. Then I got my second overseas invitation, this time to Dubrovnik in 1989, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and everyone knew the world was going to change. So both of those invitations were quietly instigated by Leonard Liggio, and Leonard was tickled. He knew those would be formative events for me, and he knew I'd never forget. So I didn't know Leonard well, but I knew him well enough that I can thank Leonard for showing me what kind of man a scholar can be, and I won't forget that either. So thanks so much, Brad, and everyone for having me here, for joining us at this event. It's one of the great honors of my career. And now let me try to connect a few historical dots in a way that I hope would have intrigued Leonard. For those Scottish Enlightenment scholars, the mid-1700s was a heady time. Europe had never seen a better opportunity to make progress. Hume and Smith were pushing the frontier of moral science. Among philosophers, a Scottish observation-based approach is called empiricism. So the Enlightenment view was that there is such a thing as human nature. It can be studied and understood. The point's not that anything like the human condition is logically necessary. It not, it's, it's not something you deduce from axioms like a proof in geometry. The point is that in crucial ways, the human condition is law-like. There are regularities. Certainty, it's not in the cards. But we can have grounds for making predictions. And so to a scientist, having a basis for prediction doesn't mean we'll never be surprised. The point is, science and the predictability of things helps us to understand what to count as a surprise. We can know when the, when the world is off script and trying to teach us something new. But it's also true that the ambition of Hume and Smith would become, I think, a victim of its own success. Their advocacy of observation-based reasoning and of specialization, incidentally, would lead in the 1800s not to philosophy becoming moral science, as they envisioned, but rather to the social sciences splitting away from philosophy, becoming their own departmental silos and leaving philosophy to reinvent itself as a discipline that was anything but empirical. By the mid-1800s, John Stuart Mill would come to be seen as taking empiricism to the limit, arguing that everything we know comes to us by experience and experiment. Even propositions like 2 plus 2 equals 4 are learned by generalizing from observed results. In his day, Mill was visible and influential as an expositor of the new moral sciences. So Mill was taken seriously when in service of making moral philosophy more scientific. He produced a series of works culminating in 1848 with the principles of political economy. In those writings, Mill separated the study of how goods are produced from the study of how goods are distributed. That's what you do for the sake of analytical rigor and tough-minded science. 
If two things can be separated, you separate them. How goods are produced is a question for these new departments of economics. How goods ought to be distributed is a question for philosophers, the ones who work on justice. Now, as one of our favorite uh, Arizona alumni, Kevin Vallier, notes, Mill also thought humanity had largely exhausted the frontier of technological progress. So to be sure, the telegraph had been invented by 1837. So by 1848, many people could see that electricity's potential, especially regarding distance communication, was far from exhausted. Even at the time then, there was ample reason to doubt that a steady state economy was around the corner and to doubt that better distribution was the only remaining avenue for substantial human progress. And yet still, for whatever reason, Mill did expect the coming age to be an economic steady state with relatively little news on the production side. Human progress would come via better distribution, not rising productivity, which made distribution the central topic. So today we don't remember Mill pressing that unfortunate distinction, but it shaped our thinking so fundamentally that we can hardly imagine not treating production and distribution as separate topics. So Scottish Enlightenment philosophers like Hume and Smith studied historical patterns that to them were relevant to questions about ethics, say the ethics of trade barriers, but ethics was no longer anchored in observable consequences of alternative trade policies, po uh, consequences for unemployment rates or for consumer prices that workers were paying. Ethics and political philosophy had turned into something else, something so far removed from science that today calling it moral science could seem oxymoronic. But sometimes what looks like two things is actually one along the lines of the morning star and the evening star. If you presume to treat them as separate simply because they appear to be so, we make mistakes. So ironically, in the aftermath of Hume's distinction between production and distribution, really pulling one question about how society works and how what makes people good for each other, pulling that question into two half questions, philosophy retreated from what empiricism had been, and it was cut off from the scientific study of what makes some societies more productive than others. The remnants of philosophy were left to ask how to just how we ought to distribute pi. So by default, we were left to assume that since distribution is the question that got left to philosophers, distribution must be the question of justice. Now, I want to ask you to consider not only how abstract, but how deceptive it is to imagine a pie sitting there passively waiting for us to decide how to slice it. Treated in academic isolation, there is no testable answer to the question of how to divide that pie. We have only rival intuitions about the fairness of dividing the pie one way or another. And when intuitions conflict, we have no tools to resolve the conflict other than to look into what's wrong with people who see things differently. Undergraduates infer from our inability to settle the debate that it's all relative or all subjective. We know they're badly mistaken, but after a century of distancing ourselves from tools for hypotheses, even our best attempts to steer students back toward verifiable truth seem more clever than wise. And yet there was a time when we knew that justice has roughly nothing to do with how we treat the pie and everything to do with how we treat bakers. If we set aside everything we've learned about the terms of engagement under which bakers are better off living together, under which they become good for each other, there's no testable answer to the question of how to divide the pie. We know justice isn't merely a matter of opinion, but we made it look that way when we started treating philosophy as outside the realm of empirical test. So philosophy is now something like this. We look at a snapshot of a busy intersection, and we don't want to think of it as a process because we don't study process. That's for somebody else. We want to think of it as like a pie, 
So we take a snapshot and we see how arbitrary it is that some people have red lights and other people have green lights. We focus exclusively on the snapshot because cause and effect, empirical generalizations about process that we study in sociology or economics or psychology, those are all autonomous uh, social sciences. Now, what works is social science. What's fair? That's philosophy. So if we set aside social science and just look at a snapshot of social life at its busy intersections where traffic is congested and conflicts of interest become apparent, then we can have a vision that's beyond the reach of testing and refutation, namely in an ideally just world, everyone would have a green light at the same time. That would be treating it like a pie. It would be gridlock, it wouldn't be prosperous, it wouldn't be productive, wouldn't be peaceful, but it would be just. So would it be? Would it really be just? How would we know? What would count as evidence? How do we start picking up the tools of social science that used to be part of philosophy and, and applying them to this kind of case? So let's say that to call something justice is to say something good about it. So what's good about justice? What, what does justice do as a way of managing an ongoing process for us? So consider that justice evolved among human beings as a device for managing traffic, literally managing traffic, uh, metaphorically managing commercial traffic, and so on. We call that traffic management device justice. Justice didn't evolve as a device for telling us what to want what our destination should be, although we have misconstrued it that way. Instead, what we call justice evolved as a device for coping with a realization that if there's going to be an enduring peace, it starts with recognizing that everyone has their own right to live, and it starts with not wanting to be a threat to our neighbors. It starts with then wanting to acknowledge, respect them as having the right and responsibility to to decide for themselves what to want. So justice evolved as a device for conveying our mutual intention not to be in each other's way, and beyond that, signaling a mutual intention to be positively useful, to be a positive contributor to the life of our neighbors, to build places for ourselves as contributors to a community playing roles that our partners can appreciate, that our neighbors can appreciate. So that leaves us needing to know what justice is. And needing to know what justice is means needing our beliefs about justice to not merely be untestable intuition, but to somehow, some way, be grounded in observable fact. So one thing we can say is that some kinds of equality, like everyone having a green light at the same time, that's a prescription for gridlock. But there are other kinds of equality. Like we simply learn to take turns. When you're next in line, then, sir, it's your turn. That doesn't look like equality when you take a snapshot of it, but that is a profoundly egalitarian institution. And in that case, justice isn't everything, but it's a foundation. And nearly everything we want from a community is built on that foundation. So let me rephrase and in the process, stress. If justice has anything to do with effective traffic management, it's helping us to know what to expect from each other, helping us to know what we're warranted in demanding of each other, then justice is all about the fact that we have different destinations. And let's ponder that for a second. Observe the extent of disagreement and diversity in society. Consider how idiosyncratic and incompatible our individual visions of perfection are, and thus how unfit any of our visions are to be a blueprint for a community. Part of the essence of toleration, of mature adulthood, of being fit to live in a community at all, is acknowledging that it isn't our place to decide what other people are for. Presupposed by all of this, the most primordial political fact of all is the fact that I'm not alone. I live among beings who decide for themselves. I may feel that people can't reasonably reject my deepest convictions about justice, but they can, and they know it. And this fact makes politics what it is, and it makes justice what it is. 
Ideally, we want to coexist in peace with all of our neighbors, not only the ideal ones, not only the perfect ones, not only the agreeable ones. Realistic idealism aims to identify what, if anything, is observably enabling people to thrive under actual conditions, not merely ideal ones. When disagreement is inevitable, the political ideal is to make disagreement non-threatening, to make it safe to disagree. A fully adult political animal's ideal is not to win, but to avoid needing to win. Honestly taking into account the fact of diversity comes down to asking what terms of engagement are appropriate for people who don't even agree on which terms of engagement are appropriate. The question isn't cute, it's the crux of the human condition. Rushing to treat our own intuitions about perfect justice as rationally compelling is a classic way of failing to rise to the level of seriousness that justice demands. So I work on theory, on understanding and explaining theory, and I work on comparing theories to maps. A theory is just like a map. A theory is a map drawn with words, and there's no map that represents the only reasonable way of seeing the terrain. There's no such thing as the one compellingly correct way to draw the map. We'd be astounded if we had two cartography students working separately on mapping a terrain and they drew identical maps. It wouldn't happen. If we did, we'd be sure at least one of them cheated. And theorizing is like that as well. If you assign them to develop theories about the same topic, they would come up with different theories. Theorizing doesn't lead to consensus. Some ideals are moral ideals, but some ideals are political ideals. We recognize that many of the people with whom we're going to live and with whom we'd rather not be at war are people whose moral ideals are unlike ours. And so we make a political decision. We determine where we're not going to agree. And then we work to make sure that in those areas, we don't need to. So does it matter that we have no consensus on destinations? In ordinary life, not much. Uh, in ordinary life, what matters far more is that we readily coordinate on norms of traffic management. We figure out what to expect from each other. We figure out how to stay out of each other's way. We hardly ever come to a mutual understanding about who has the superior destination, and yet we have a robust history of readily reaching mutual understanding about who has the right of way. So freedom of religion, it's one of humanity's greatest triumphs. You don't need to decide whether my choice of religion is a good choice. You only need to decide whether it's my choice. What won the day was not a religion, but people seeing that religion didn't have to come up for debate. And what grew in the soil of religious freedom, I should say, it's more general than religious toleration. It's the whole of modern Western civilization. Our greatest triumphs in learning to live together stem not from agreeing on what's correct, but from agreeing to let people decide for themselves. When discussion isn't needed, that's a triumph in specifying terms of engagement. We make progress by defining jurisdictions that respect people who want and need to share the road, but neither want nor need to share or even discuss destinations. And above all, no one has to accept being relegated to a category of persons whose destination is second class. Thriving communities minimize our need to justify our destination to others. Indeed, a traffic management system's utility lies in people not needing to justify themselves. We don't stop at intersections to justify our destinations. We stop because it's someone else's turn. Freedom of religion and freedom of speech are among our signature successes in learning how to live together. Liberalism in its classic form is in part a confidence that the greater the range of beliefs made to feel at home in a society, the more intellectually vibrant, materially prosperous, and morally progressive a society ultimately will be. Thank you for the time and I wish you well.